All right, let's get started. Uh, uh, my name is Robert Fox, and uh, if you put one on one together, you may figure out that this conference is totally named after me. Totally. Uh, which is why I was invited the third year. It's very confusing. No, 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 none of those things are true. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, running Android on uh, top of an entirely open source graphics stack. And uh, I've been doing this work for Glamour. Um, and if you want to get, get a hold of me, there's some contact details. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions about this stuff, I'm always interested. So, yeah, let's get into it. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the history of Android, uh, what the Android graphics stack looks like, what the mainline Android graphics stack looks like. They're not entirely uh, identical. And also the, the bigger picture of what's actually going on and uh, what may be coming down the pipeline. So, uh, this is an interesting graph. Uh, it's the uh, diff, the number of lines diff uh, from mainline kernel to various uh, equivalent uh, Qualcomm kernels. So it's around like know, two and a half million lines, uh, which is a lot of lines. Or sorry, uh, yeah, two and a half million lines. <coughs> so there's no really clear trend. Like we're seeing somewhat of a slope here, but uh, I think it's a little bit early to draw any conclusions. Um, yeah, so it's mostly stable, I'd say. And the reason for this is that Android basically forked the kernel. They uh, have been doing their own thing for a long time. And for good reasons, they didn't do it willy-nilly. They had hard requirements that the kernel just couldn't provide. Uh, specifically relating to the graphics stack, uh, it wasn't really good, good enough for a mobile use case. There were some parts missing, there were some parts that were suboptimal, and in general, it wasn't, uh, the graphics stack was never intended for a low-powered usage scenario. Um, so, um, support for uh, device types, for example, uh, display IP wasn't so good uh, with the uh, then current uh, APIs, the KMS API specifically. Um, and there was an entire lot, there, there was no support at all for doing atomic instructions or atomic uh, commits or anything atomic really. So uh, doing things atomically is really important. When you have a graphics stack, there's a lot of state in it and it's hard to know exactly what kind of state your hardware is in. And if you do a bunch of operations and it sort of fails somewhere in the middle, uh, figuring out where you are is uh, near impossible and uh, just an ocean of bugs waiting to happen. So uh, the need for being able to do a bunch of things together and have them all fail or all succeed in, auto in an atomic manner is, is very real. And the kernel at the time didn't support it at all. So that's one motivation for, for the fork. Uh, so what happened was that um, Greg, uh, Greg Hackman at uh, Google has submitted a, a, um, a series of patches for creating the Android Atomic uh, that's, uh, display framework and uh, uh, it uh, scratched pretty much all of the itches that uh, Google and Android had. So. That, that solved their problem, but not really our problem. Uh, the ADF, or the yeah, Android Atomic Display Framework, it's called ADF, it's not really extensible, which is problematic for the, like, the more general use case. Uh, you want to be able to support all kinds of weird and wonderful hardware, because there's lots of it out there. Uh, it also only supported uh, atomic commits for uh, display plates, not for things like connectors or, or other parts of display stack. So only one part of it, let's say a third, uh, actually had atomic support, which is a nice like addition, but it's not good enough, really. 
Also, it was built on top of none of the current, uh, or then current uh, APIs. So it was entirely different, and uh, no code or no, uh, no users of the API were able to like, gracefully migrate. You just had to implement, implement uh, API support from scratch, uh, which is inconvenient. So it, all in all, that meant that uh, ADF wasn't really upstreamable. It's not the solution that the community wanted. Uh, so uh, what happened next was the uh, uh, upstream uh, alternative was presented. And it was called, or it is called, uh, Atomic KMS. KMS is the API that uh, was used before ADF was introduced. And Atomic KMS is the atomic flavor of KMS. Uh, and it supports all of the ADF use cases. So it has all of the same properties. And additionally, it is generic and extensible. So the way um, Atomic KMS uh, works is basically you set a bunch of properties that you want, and then you go commit. And, uh, Either that fails or it doesn't fail. And these uh, properties are extensible. You can add whatever properties you want for your driver. So if your weird and wonderful hardware has support for something that has never existed before, you can just add a property for it. And user space can use it if it feels like it, or if it's aware of it. Uh, so that's very accessible and nice. Uh, so what's happening now is that the ADF is being replaced um, in vendor drivers uh, by Atomic KMS, which is nice because it's the solution the community uh, uh, ended up using or yeah, supporting. Uh, so a migration from ADF uh, to Atomic KMS is currently happening, but it's sort of a, a glacially paced migration. So all the proprietary Android uh, graphics drivers are currently based on ADF. Um, because there was no option, really. If you wanted to ship Android on your device or on your hardware, you really had to support uh, ADF. It was the only uh, uh, API that was uh, basically allowed on the Android ecosystem, which means that every proprietary driver today is ADF-based, but hopefully not, not for long. So uh, that brings us to what the Android graphics stack actually looks like. And this is it. It's not so complicated, <laughs> uh, or this is a little bit simplified, but all the important parts are, are really here. Uh, lots of junk is hidden in this vendor driver box, but we're going to dig into that until yeah, our, our heart's content, basically. Uh, so on top we have the uh, apps. This is what we want, really. Like, this is the goal. So, uh, yeah. Below we have Surface Linger. Surface Linger is sort of a glue component. It allows all the applications to uh, render into basically a single buffer, which means that uh, the applications don't really have to be aware of each other. Surface Linger fixes this uh, automatically for every application. Uh, let's have a look at what it can look like. So here's uh, just a landscape Android um, desktop, I guess. Uh, and it has a bunch of components. Um, components like the, the status bar that's rendered by an application. It's mostly transparent. It's a relatively like small piece of uh, screen real estate. And it's actually not backed by a full buffer. It's only backed by a buffer that's this big. Uh, which means that we can save a lot of memory space. And uh, memory space is yeah, a scarce resource and memory bandwidth is also a scarce resource. So that's very desirable. Uh, then there's the navigation bar, also rendered by a separate uh, component. And the biggest piece of them all, the background. So these are all combined uh, by Surface Flinger. And as you can see, most, you know, except for the background, most of them are like transparent. So, yeah. Uh, Surface Linger does this by uh, juggling a bunch of buffers and it speaks the, or it communicates these buffers to the hardware 
uh, using a protocol call, called HWC. And uh, uh, HWC is then used to talk to the actual hardware in yeah, whatever way the, the hardware prefers. So let's look at what the, the hardware composer actually does. And what it does is that it receives a bunch of layers from from a surface finger, like a, as many layers as you want. And then it optimizes this. We'll get into that. There is a little bit to it. Uh, and then it just sends it to the display hardware. And this is where stuff gets complicated. Before uh, the, the last step, it's, everything's all fine and good because we're all software, like software above, software below. But when we output it to actual display hardware, there are hard restrictions. Uh, display hardware typically doesn't support an infinite set of layers. Maybe uh, uh, four is common. I think that's the, uh, the Android guideline. Your display hardware should be able to support at least four layers. So what happens when you have more than four layers? If we looked at the, the background picture from before, like we counted three, but we weren't really uh, paying all that close attention, there's actually Know, maybe five. So we have five layers. Um, how do do we actually manage to output this if the hardware only supports four? And um, what we do is basically we combine a few uh, layers. We squash them. So we'll pick uh, maybe the the smallest layers or the layers that are easiest computationally to combine, and we combine them on the CPU or on the GPU. And we do that, we just repeat that process until we have a few enough layers that the hardware actually supports to or supports outputting all of them. So when we end up just having four, we're done, and we can just set them all to the display hardware, and uh, that's all well and good. So we have this process, and it sounds kind of complicated. Why do we want to do it at all? And uh, there are very good reasons for wanting to use uh, display, uh, display IP or display hardware. Um, first and foremostly, uh, it's way more power efficient than using a CPU to output the stuff just to a down buffer. Uh, if you have hardware acceleration for, for uh, these functions, you save a lot of power. But you also free up CPU resources or GPU resources, whatever you would have used um, instead. And that not only uh, uh, that only that not, not only allows you to use less power, but but also you free up the resources to use for what you actually want to do. So if you're playing games, your GPU is not managing buffers and smashing them together. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in OpenGL performance or Vulkan performance or whatever uh, it may be. So th those are basically the reasons for going through all this complexity and. There's, yeah, there's certainly enough complexity to it. So if we continue looking at the stack, here's uh, the vendor driver. This is the proprietary blob that ARM will give you or whomever your vendor may be. Um, and it includes a hardware composer component. Something, just something that implements this protocol. It has to be, it has to be implemented somewhere and for a uh, proprietary stack, it's just in the blog somewhere. Uh, it also implements OpenGL, uh, Vulkan, a memory allocator, like a bunch of junk. Like a, a bunch of things are included into what we think of as a driver. And on the bottom, or in the bottom, we, we have the Linux kernel, of course. Um, uh, so, if we look at the, the mainline graphics stack, the current status is that we have a pretty darn, pretty darn good API, and it's very usable. In fact, it's so useful that Google has shipped devices built on top of it, or it has shipped one product, the uh, uh, Google Pixel C, which was run on top of almost an entirely open source graphics stack. Not not entirely. Uh, they did some funny business with uh, well, with the uh, 
the NVIDIA driver, where they ran uh, the nouveau kernel part of the driver, but not the user space part of the driver. They just picked up the NVIDIA proprietary user, uh, user space part of the driver, which is sort of a weird, weird way to go about it, but yeah, whatever works, I guess. And the problem with uh, doing it this way is uh, something has to implement HWC, just something. Typically, that's uh, the task of, uh, of the proprietary driver, but in the open source stack, there's nothing that really naturally implements it. So Mesa does, doesn't it implement it. That's where I would start looking for it, if I were to look for it. And the kernel certainly doesn't implement it. So we need something that does implement it, and the answer to that is a DRM hardware composer. And DRM hardware composer uh, is just a, a pretty thin like shim, basically, between uh, Surface Flinger and the normal open source graphics stack. Uh, so let's have a look at what it actually looks like. So this is the stack we were looking at before, and here's the proprietary blob of stuff. Um, and if we dig into what it actually is, it looks something like this on the open source side. Uh, so we have the driver stuff. This is the normal stuff you'd run on on Ubuntu or whatever. And on top of it, we run DRM hardware composer, which essentially just speaks um, HWC2 to Surface Planner. And, and that's it. But <laughs> wait, there's more. Uh, there's also uh, Mesa and the DRM. These are part of your, your normal graphics stack as well. Um, Mesa implements uh, many of the APIs you're used to using for, uh, for graphics like OpenGL or uh, Vulkan. Uh, LibDRM is uh, a, yeah, it's a user space uh, API for talking to the kernel DRM subsystem. And the kernel DRM subsystem is where all the graphics drivers live. So all the graphics related things, including the display hardware, uh, lives there. And talking to it is sort of inconvenient. If, you, if you're used to writing kernel drivers, it's I octal this, I octal that, and uh, it's not a convenient way of communicating with anything. So LibDRM sort of wraps those APIs and makes them a little bit more convenient to use. And for the last part, there is Granok. Granok is the graphics memory allocator. Um, if you go looking for a, for a component named Granok, there isn't one really. Instead, there are, I think, four, four separate implementations of, of uh, graphics allocators. In general, it's not really a, a, a solved uh, problem. It's partially solved in four different ways. Uh, which is problematic, but uh, for example, there's uh, the DRM, uh, DRM Granlock, there's the GBM Granlock, which is the current community favorite, there's uh, uh, Mini GBM by Google and the Chromium OS team, and then there's Mini GBM again, but this time by Intel, so there's the Intel Mini GBM as well, which is uh, Mini GBM with a bunch of fixes, or rather hacks to make Intel hardware work a little bit better. Uh, so the situation is uh, a little bit messy in that, in that specific area. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, HWC2. Sorry? Can you take a question now? Sure, yeah. Uh, if you go back one, now that you decompose it so much, can you clarify on which parts are running in kernel space and user space? Yep. Um, so let's have a look here. This is all kernel space, and everything above is user space. Uh, this picture is a little bit confusing. This one's confusing as well. But DRM and kernel are both uh, the kernel. DRM is just a subsystem in the kernel. Uh, good question. So uh, the HWC2 API. There, uh, there was a one, of course, HWC1, or just HWC, I guess. Um, why the two? And uh, something uh, <clears throat> around, uh, yeah, let's see, uh, Android 4, I think. 
Um, Android added support in the kernel for uh, uh, something called Fences. And Fences is a way of communicating um, about memory buffers and making different components um, be able to just know when a buffer is ready to be consumed or when it's ready to be uh, sent out to the next guy. And uh, Fences really makes that a lot more simple. Uh, it uh, removes the need for doing like threading and mutexes in the, in the hardware composer, which is nice because that stuff is always really messy and unpleasant. Uh, so instead we just have this very simple uh, API. And uh, this is um, sort of where I came into it. Um, so Android had this fence support for, uh, for a long time. And uh, I think uh, about two years ago, uh, there was an initiative to, to implement the support in the uh, upstream mainline kernel as well. So we did, uh, but in order to get it accepted in the kernel, it had to be used somewhere. And getting it used somewhere is a little bit tricky. You probably don't want to just, just like dig into the innards of Wayland or the X server, that's messy stuff. So the smallest possible project to add support for this in is DRM Hardware Composer. So that's uh, what I did. Uh, I just added support for fences and uh, yeah, as it's not as a hard requirement for implementing the HWC2 API. And the HWC2 API is a hard requirement for modern versions of Android. It was something that was kind of desired and just nice to have, apart from being relatively straightforward to implement. So, yeah, HWC2 is better now. <laughs> uh, and this happened in uh, 2016. Uh, it was a collaborant, Gustavo Padawan, that uh, uh, did most of the work for moving um, FS port into the mainline kernel. Yeah, and uh, this is the part that I did, just added support. It wasn't too complicated. And this project, DRM Hardware Composer, uh, originated within Google and their Chromium OS team. Um, it was created by Sean Paul and Zach Reisner within the Google, Google Chromium OS team. Um, but since not too long ago, it's uh, under the umbrella of uh, the freedesktop.org organization, which is where all the mainline graphics stack stuff lives, essentially. And the move was largely uh, due to Sean Paul and Pune Kumar, Marissa Wall at Google who were nice enough to uh, and not only just move it, but moving it means that they are going to continuously go through a bunch of troubles uh, when they want to ship this stuff. Because now they have to integrate like an external component instead of just relying on, it, on an internal component, which is a lot simpler for them. So, yeah, thanks guys, that's very helpful. Um, and if you want to contribute, um, you can at gitlab.freedustop.org. So uh, let's have a look at what the current status is. Uh, this effort has been uh, yeah, brought to fruition on a bunch of platform platforms, and uh, we can have a look at a few of them. There's the IMX6, which is a very common platform in the embedded space. It runs the uh, um, Ethnaviv uh, graphics driver, which, yeah, since like a year ago, has become a very viable like uh, um, GPU driver to use. Uh, there is the Dragonboard 410C, which is on a Qualcomm part. It has an Adreno GPU, and it is supported by the um, by the Freedreno graphics driver, which is also like really good, like top-notch quality, and uh, supports all the features um, that Android requires, specifically fences. Um, currently, the high key 960 is under development. Uh, it has a Molly GPU, unfortunately. Uh, I say unfortunately because ARM is not so good with the open source drivers. They really don't want one. Um, however, there are some efforts in the department as well. Um, the Molly G71 is a relatively modern part. 
which means that the open source effort will probably not uh, support it for a rather long time. But currently there's like a yeah, very alpha quality driver that is drawing its first triangles now. So you can't really use it for something like Android, but it may be an indication of what's to come, or so I hope, anyway. Uh, so this platform is under development by Linaro. Uh, I assume they're paid by uh, uh, the, uh, let's see, High Silicon, I think. Yeah, High Silicon makes the high key. Uh, uh, so. so we've covered the current status. Uh, let's look forward to uh, uh, what's going to happen next and what's been happening, I guess. Uh, so this is what seems to happen. Uh, a feature is introduced in Android. Some features are good, some are bad, some are, yeah, crazy. Uh, and they're slowly migrated into the kernel if they're good and if, it, if there's a, a community need or desire for these features. In the case of, of uh, uh, Fences, that took, I don't know how long, maybe five years? So the time scale is very long, but this does seem to happen, and we as in the wider community are getting something out of Android, which is very nice. We essentially get this stuff, well, not for free, but it's relatively low effort when there's already a proof of concept out there, there's code that's open source, we can just take it, modify it to our needs, and then make it accessible to, uh, to everyone. However, uh, this isn't entirely true for all subsystems. If we look at the, uh, the diff, uh, but split up across different parts of the kernel, we can see that uh, this whole bottom part is drivers. Uh, and drivers are never going to be upstream for various reasons. Or some drivers will be, but the majority of them, there's too much, uh, too much sharing in. So for every new cell phone, there's a few tweaks here and there, and uh, there's not really any community effort behind like supporting all of them. They would be too much work. And to add to that, uh, most of these drivers uh, run a proprietary firmware blob. So they just load some stuff into memory, and then the hardware magically works. So the stuff that's loaded into memory, we don't have any control over. Sometimes it's signed, so even if we wanted the control over it, we can't have it. Um, sometimes it's not, but the device is probably, maybe, by the time we're, we're interested in it, it's maybe never going to be sold again in a new device. So supporting your old phone is, is just that. You can support your old phone from three years ago, but it's not going to help you with the next generation of stuff. Like, it's a one-time effort. Perfect. Yeah? So actually, I have a good news about that. I had just come back for the OSPM conference in Italy this week, and the Google kernel guys are there, and they say they actually figure out how to do it and work with kernel LTS. So the next Google will be with four point something with LTS kernel officially. So it will be in mainline. So, so, the way I understand Google's long-term strategy with the kernel is to take uh, the kernel LTSs and spin up an Android baseline LTS from that, from a few of the web versions, and then those baseline LTSs are sent or used by the vendors, like Qualcomm, to add whatever Qualcomm magic they need, just a, a pile of stuff, uh, and that pile of stuff is what we're seeing here in the diff, like that's the hardware we're probably never going to see support for. Uh, I do think that Google cares. This is painful for them. This is painful for us too. Uh, but there's only so much influence they have. The vendors need to support their hardware somehow, and they have very little interest in upstreaming much of this stuff. Uh, so. In terms of, of having uh, interests aligned, I think our community interests are very well aligned with Google in general, but uh, hardware vendors aren't as interested in this stuff. So, yeah, getting back to the diff, it's pretty con constant. Like, it's, there's no clear trend here. Uh, and much of it is drivers, uh, unfortunately. 
but um, overall, there's uh, I, I would say there's a lot of positive to be positive things to be said. Um, we're slowly pushing um, the industry towards open source, and by doing so, we're able to increase development speed for let's say a small company that just want to make or run Android on, on their own platform. Um, that's relatively feasible. You can do that. Uh, like one one engineer in a few like months would probably be able to bring up Android on a new device, given that the, the hardware selected has good kernel support. So yeah, using one of the the um, yeah, most normal uh, embedded platforms is probably a good way to go about it. Making sure that the graphics part is well supported within the kernel. That there's not a lot more of the not required to bring something up. <coughs> so uh, this also ties into uh, uh, a small vendor being able to uh, uh, get started with the stuff by having all, the, all this infrastructure available. Uh, anyone can do it. Like, you can do it. You, you totally can. This isn't so complicated as it may seem. You just need a um, yeah that hardware device that's easy to uh, to. Uh, program basically. Another part of this that's sort of not really spoken about too much and maybe not obvious is that the open source drivers have a quality that's normally higher higher than the proprietary ones. If we look at the uh, Vivanti uh, GPU drivers for example, they're not so good. In fact, they're very not so good, uh, which is <laughs> nice for us in the sense that we can easily make something that's as good, but we can also surpass them. We can make something that's better than, than uh, anything that's ever existed before. And uh, yeah, that's, I guess, a nice feather in, in our cap. And lastly, all this work, I think, in general, is pushing open source forward. Like, we're pushing into the uh, proprietary driver space, and we're also pushing Android uh, into a realm where it's very accessible by, by normal people, like small corporations or just individuals, which is rather nice. That's what I care about, making open source available to everyone. And uh, that's it. If you want to get a hold of me, there's my Twitter handle. Uh, any questions? Yeah. You. like in the DRM kernel driver and in the recovery, Android recovery, uh, like it doesn't work because the page flip, like the atomic page returns immediately and then it just crashes. And like is that still being developed in the Android recovery or do I need to do some changes in the kernel? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, I don't actually know. <laughs> I think you'd have to send me some logs for, for me to look at that. Um, generally speaking, working against AOSD Master is really hard. Like it's developed at a, at a breakneck speed, uh, faster than you or a team of like a handful of people can can keep up with. So what you are better off doing is selecting a version that suits your needs and then sticking to it and fixing all the issues surrounding it, and then skipping ahead whenever you. Yeah, have the resources to do so. Yeah. So what are the building blocks if you want to build ASP on my Intel hardware? Yep. You need, of course, ASP, you need relatively the new kernel. Mm -hmm. Then you still need to put in some, because the, the hardware composite 2 isn't in the kernel yet, or? Uh, so, yeah. Um, so in order to have an entirely open source stack, um, you need the DRM hardware composite component. You need Mesa, you need some Gralloc, you just pick one that fulfills your needs. Um, and a kernel that's just built with uh, support for Android and whatever hardware you have laying around. Um, this is easy done by looking at uh, the Linaro build manifests. They maintain a few manifests for different targets. Um, even x86, mostly for debugging purposes. Um, so 
a manifest is sort of part of the um, version control um, that's used for uh, for Android, and you can uh, add in a like a local manifest that uh, supplements the uh, the uh, normal um, Android version you've been checking out, and it will pull in additional components and remove some components that are conflicting, and. By using a local manifest, you can get access to the Linaro uh, x86 and ARM v8 uh, and v7 targets, which contains all this stuff. Yeah. One yeah. So you showed me the show about the hardware proposal too. That in normal uh, phone hardware, you have maybe four you know, hardware layers basically to the stack. How do you solve it now? Do you just do software-wise flapping them before you send them to the graphics driver? So the ARM hardware composer does this poorly uh, by just uh, using the CPU to flatten these layers. You can do it using OpenGL if you want to, you can do, this, do it using Vulkan if you want to be fancy, but uh, support for doing it with both those things, uh, actually the OpenGL support is there, the Vulkan support is not. Uh, so you can use your GPU if you want to. Okay. Any more questions? Alright, we're done.